Okay, everybody, uh, thanks for coming back. Uh, it's only after lunch, I'm sure you're all uh, feeling nice and full from that. Um, and so I'm the uh, chair for this uh, next session on crowdsourcing for accessibility, um, uh, which we're going to euphemistically call the IBM session, because uh, you know, it just shows how much crowdsourcing is going on at IBM uh, for this session. Um, we've got um, a substitution in this session, which you, uh, which you might have seen on the online program on the conversational um, and that's going to be the last, um, the last one. Um, the middle tech. that are reporting on that, but they are also able to produce the data. And actually, if we want to understand uh, the needs of what you want, uh, the best thing that we can do is to get information directly from that. So uh, for us, uh, we are really looking to questions. First, how can we, how can we engage with this industry? Tools that will let us know what kind of accessibility is. And the second challenge is having this information, how can we use it in order to construct an accessibility map? Okay. And important to mention there are two related words, this one. And but what they have is something more uh, fixed. So some people did some research in the past, they constructed some accessibility maps, but these maps are fixed. And what we want to do uh, is to create in the future something more dynamic. So something that will show some changes on accessibility issues that are really even real time. So okay, uh, these pictures are from Brazil. You can all here you see that this kind of thing are global and it's very usual, it's very common for for us that we produce to complain about the government. But actually if we look at their sites quite hard for them to catalog and keep track of all the accessibility issues that they have in the cities. And more important than that, okay, they have a lot of problems, they know that they have, but they have to know somehow which problems they have to tackle first. So if, uh, 
if you have a city like Sao Paulo, probably you have like 10,000, 50,000 problems. There's an order of problems that there's a hierarchy you would see. Some problems are more important uh, and you have to solve them faster. And this is the kind of question that we press. So we want to identify the problems and we want to identify which ones serve a higher priority. And by crowdsourcing, because I mentioned in the beginning, we are having the portable devices. So now we have smartphone status, people are using the communities are using them, and a very few of these devices that have sensors. So, uh, our project is actually this is a part of something bigger that we are constructing. It's a citizen sensory platform, and this is closely related with what we have presented in the morning. So, we have a platform that has basically three parts. The first one is the, the sensors, so this is what we are using to collect the data. The second part is consists of a storage and analytics part, so we have to store this data somehow. This data may get very big and very complicated to analyze. And then finally, some output interface. An interface can be for people, abilities for yeah, whatever, and also for the city. So the whole thing is is huge. Here we are talking about uh, an accessibility scenario, but it's somehow clear that it doesn't have to be restricted to accessibility. Right? It's the kind of problem that we can. There are many problems that we can address using this platform. So, okay, uh, for, for this work, uh, we are going to describe an experiment that we did with two applications that we, we developed in IBM. The first one is what Diego showed already, the citizen sensor. In this context, it's very simple. So, we created a version of the citizen sensor that enables the people to report about the accessibility issues that, are, that they see uh, in the city. And, yeah. Uh, one nice way of seeing that the data that is being collected uh, is shown in this map. So if you have a map, here is the map of some old city, and here you have some reports. And that is showing, according to the color, how many reports you have. This, uh, the quantity is showing this left hand side. And on the map, where these reports are assigned to, so where they were. Were made. And finally, the other application uh, is the, the breadcrumb. And this one is uh, very similar to, to the MIT fund. And this one is actually it's an Android application that when you turn it on, it just collects for geographical position every 10 seconds. And that's it. There's no user interaction. The person is doing basically nothing. Yeah, here we put something, but the person doesn't have to use this. And the whole thing is that it's something running on the background. So if you give this application to a person with a bit, it doesn't have any, you will not have any issue with, uh, with accessibility. And also for other people. Uh, if you want to, to run games, if you want to go the internet and, and stuff, you can do everything that you want to do, and data will still be collected. And this, we, we notice that it's important because people will not To, to provide a data. So, okay, our experiment, uh, what 
we wanted to do application papers or just and what we wanted to check is first thing rather you have the data. Uh, real data session. But the thing is, uh, if we look uh, uh, close to the region of the P, we can see that the, uh, the speed was low already. It's why, 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 is it, why did it happen? And then we look the person that she said, actually there was a cross there. 
And this is a problem that we have with crowdsourcing this data collection. We may have this outline that if you have very few data, you are not able to tell if they are something that you have to figure out or not. So this is something that is important for our platform. We need to reach critical mass in order to produce data, in order to collect information that will allow us to remove to, to figure out this kind of uh, false alerts, so to say. And also, we saw that uh, this local interactivity is important. So if you have your IBM, it's very, uh, very slow, okay, so it's, it's reasonable to assume that first of all, what they are very there. And this is happening not because of accessibility issues, it's just because the, the place like this, that there's not the city. Okay. So, okay, uh, our conclusion was basically that apparently the platform to make more of our tests, to, to refine our, our tools, but uh, our first results in promising, so to say. And as I told you, what we want to do in the end is to create a dynamic map. And in order to have something like this, besides the, the creating OMS, we also need to develop some other technical tools. So one that is very important is the project. So there's an event taking place now, and frequently this event leads to some other events that bring accessibility to people. People then we want to predict this in order to, to make this uh, Finally, in the system sensitive report application, the person also has the possibility to send some text messages and eventually record voice messages. If you have this information, we also are able to some sentiment analysis to see what's the impact that an event has in this person's life. With these, it's easier to do priority that utilization, which means which events are more important and which events are less important. And this is the kind of information that see the team is for that. And that's it. Um, any questions? Questions. Okay, I've got questions. Um, so, can you tell me again how many users and how much data did you collect? Very few. We just had this one single person in front of the. Right. One single person who get data they collect was how how much data they had and how many points did you collect? So, Minutes, seconds, yeah, around 1,500 points. Okay, so, 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 the point is, is that from to only be useful to keep people back on the if not, no. So, right time, uh, when we started to design a platform, our goal is to create something that could be able to collect as much data as possible. Well, okay. the answer is yes, it's here. Okay, and I've got more, but I'll just see if anybody else has got anybody and we've got a question before I keep going on with mine. Okay, so I've got more. Um, so, you're using GPS. Yes. Um, could you use the other kinds of stuff that's on the phone, like the whole thing? So you can get position response that's internal, you can get that's based on the internal movement, so you can do something um, inside. Yeah, this is something that we have to investigate. Uh, one thing that we wanted to use was uh, the accelerometer. The biggest problem is we need some, actually, we spent a lot of time trying to see what we could uh, get from the accelerometer. And our conclusion so far is that the data that the accelerometer sensor produces is useless. It's completely noisy and it's very, very hard to make. So, 
I, I've read some some material already. Some people were trying to do something special for indoor accessibility, but I haven't seen something that we can deploy soon. You know, we don't have skeptical. Yeah, I mean, I can understand that, but I think you know, right here, a thousand people in the comments said to agree with that, there's very good science very quickly, I think, which would be that really useful for doing something. Well, yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Okay, so if there's no more questions, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, and so while uh, the hero is setting up for his one, um, just a couple of announcements which I uh, neglected to make earlier. Um, so first of all, for the challenge, could, you make, could everybody make sure that you get your challenge votes in the box at the back, the very back, so there's a box at the very back for your challenge votes, and also for people who uh, want to make suggestions for camp practice tomorrow, and also if you want to see what's there's a board back and you just see the post on top. Okay, so we've got the second one, which is uh, you know, zero. Uh, so you see. <laughs> From IBM uh, TRL, um, and we're going to be talking about platform for this. Thank you, and I'm Jeremy. We were at the discussion, and crowdsourcing the platform again. And also blind people die at a child are very difficult to, to run. So this is the And the fire has probably been the process with the approach is is very important. If we can we capture the various action media types, including some transportation information talking about and then combine you know the digital with this this type process then provide a description. It's really important of course. It's the how to share the big challenge. And for example, we cannot expose our most of the presentation material to mechanical talk because of the combination. We have to, we need to learn very strict combination of the information from company strategy, the new technology. You know, this is a reality from enterprise environment. And if we use in the design, the only way to Keep confidentiality is crowdsourced to enterprise employees. So in, the, in, in my company, quite big, and we have 400,000 people working on the research. Okay, 500,000. Five, five, five so 450,000 people 
Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of you know, similar to public <laughs> Not exactly public, but close to public. And crowds also need to go through, but everybody is so pleased. Especially if you, know, if you need some specific information, and we need to have support from people with special knowledge. For example, can you do understand GB? Sure, of course. GBS is the global business service. And establish social media. ACM is not just ACM, it's advanced case management. <laughs> GBS is not just GBS. Global service. And this area has two meanings, sustainable agreement and software license agreement. <laughs> it's our, not that job. <laughs> John means our top research, this, the top of research. And his name is John. So John always means top of research. And you know Jimmy? <laughs> you don't know. Jimmy is our CEO. So Jimmy always means CEO. You know, enterprise environment is like that. Knowledge is so special. Specialized knowledge. And we need to have such, so only employees have such special knowledge. So that's why we need the PWD, we pass the disability, employees need help by calling So then we, uh, we, so that's why we, uh, we have been developing various types of crowdsourcing. Applications like adding captions or digitization of document or any other and, and then web access web access media improvement. And I will show you later. But we have the various types of crowdsourcing application inside the company. But the challenge is to advertise. The challenge is to notify people and acquire people's participation. So that's why we came up with the idea to literally advertise various types of crowdsourcing application to people through various uh, user interface point people usually ask. For example, for a website in example for a weekend, and we decided to embed one advertising into the portal. Or left and right side in the example of mail client, we can advertise our activity on the an email client. So then let me in the uh, uh, so the basic architecture is like that. So we have various items in the crowdsourcing activity and they analyze those activities and convert it into the advertisement just like small hard style hard style advertising. And then use some recommendation engine, we distribute those activities to be it's very similar to the you know web web banner or web advertisement as well. So let me briefly demonstrate. Uh, let me introduce some um, crowdsourcing applications in your company. Uh, it's not crowdsourcing. So, Appon, this is our internal inside internal tool to convert presentation files into HTML or text files. So, this is an example of the text file, an HTML file converted, uh, converted from the, our my presentation. In this I just put and so this is the text format so you can see some structure here. And another is the digitization. So it's a, in short this is an OCR collection for browsers. So the various types of user interviews are provided for the classroom and in this case an user can easily so Chinese character is only the character. And the user interface is optimized or simple to Actually, we are working with the uh, National Braille Library to you know, decide some this decide physical tools into DG form. So this is the example of such such tasks. And then it's a detection installation. And another example is so 
So this encapsulating application. So and this and we'll stop. Any problem?
practically we are here from Platinum. Okay, so what is the incentive for people contributing to the system? Do they get any rewards or words or whatever? Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. In the past, in the past, we uh, we had an event in Portugal and give some our people the centennial to some year. We start celebrating centennial and so in, in the case I will CSR division. I forgot what they gave to and going to anyway, somehow the total contributed. So and right now we don't have such awards, but we may need not simple point maker. Or one of the one of the methods that um, we took in crowd uh, the crowd something translation was you know CSR division committee to donate some some funding to a specific organization along with people's participation. If people participate more, then CSR division donate more. So this is kind of why smart way to encourage people. So we need something good. Yeah. That's great. I mean, yes, Jeff. Hi, Hiro. Um, Hi. Uh, so so uh, uh, I, I wondered if you could comment on um, some other approaches that people have taken to try to address the confidentiality uh, concerns of enterprises. So in particular, one approach that I think some large companies are using um, is splitting up whatever the task is into little bits. So for instance, the captioning task, you might imagine splitting it up into just a very small segment of a, few, a second or two um, with the idea that maybe you're not revealing information you're not supposed to with the uh, concepts of these little segments. And then the other is uh, there are some large software companies that have internal crowdsourcing marketplaces. Um, so we might all expect that, say, Amazon has that, and there are a few others that have these. So I was wondering um, if you thought about either of those, either structuring the tasks so that confidentiality is more likely to be maintained, uh, or um, So the second problem and in this sentence should be understandable, right? <laughs> so, so that's why uh, we had this in the IBM, but it may be difficult because sentences can be understandable to people. So it may be impossible to also to general public in India. So that's what that's what yeah. And for the for example, some applications like this, like this we can divide into captions. And the one character means, so it, maybe, you know, in the case of this, maybe possible caption may be a bit flexible. We need to invest in more. And for the internal crowd sourcing market, we have for tasks, business tasks, but only for business tasks, not for the, you know, this kind of employee. And support, support. So it's possible to use such marketplace, but still, again, we have challenges you know, to notify people about such activities. So for the monetary, for what in real serious business challenges, people may pay attention. And for, the, for those kind of nice terms, sometimes very difficult. So we need to see. Okay, any more questions for you? Hi. Uh, so, um, so I'm quite interested in this idea of uh, the sort of workplace and confidentiality around sort of um, A long time ago, a long time ago, there used to be rooms full of people who were called computers and did the computer. It makes me wonder whether you said this marketplace. There's any value in companies having employed people to do the stress just because mainly it seems to be the crowdsourcing needs it's it's 
something that many people can do, but it's not something that companies do. So is there an any anywhere that I get my habits over the crowdsourcing division whereby it's not marketing, it's a few more translations on it, just get out there to some more sets of people. You mean higher people? Yeah. yeah, just type people in their own place to be crowds. But yeah, the amount of the idea of it is not a good business. I try to get a much bigger to people present. And maybe there are possibilities to contract with the IQ rate and then process the image recognition there. And and the image of the search by having it. Again, you know, it may may be possible, but at this point, eight or six. Yeah. yeah, and of course, for example, Caption Park is a real kind of captioning company, and we trust them. And we, we program this thing for the internal data. Right? So, it's, you know, we know they, they are trusted company who buys and our method, we, we can track who works. So for our final talk today, uh, I'll uh, okay. so, no, here we go again. 20%, uh -oh. Hello. Hey, there we go. Right. Yes, my name's Dale. I'm going to be talking about a project. audience about the challenges of screen reading. So we were looking at stuff at the time it takes. You know, a site like this, the BBC News, that I look at every day, on the default settings it takes a screen reader 15 minutes or more to read this out. Now you throw a workaround, you can turn up the speed of the text. But that still doesn't get around the fact that it's quite a large cognitive burden to put on the user. With, you know, the, the software is reading what's on the page in the order that it sees it. And it's leaving it for the user to keep all of that in their head, to build some sort of mental model of what options are available to them, where they are, and then to sort of take the task they want to perform and translate that into the physical actions they need to do, like the right number of tab presses and so on. So the motivation was, well, can we shift that balance a bit? Can we get the software to do a little more? Can we require the user to have to do a little less? Because if the software understood more about the page it was reading out, it wouldn't need to read it all out. It could just read out the bits that are important. And if it knew more about what I was trying to do as a user, I wouldn't need to describe the individual physical actions. I could just describe what I'm trying to do and let the software convert that into step. Um, I want to explain a bit more what I mean about this. So, for example, when I go to, say, the BBC News site for the first time, what do I want to use it? Do I want it all read out? Or would I write it here? This looks like a new site. Uh, or it's like a retail site or so on. Um, do I want to know what the, for example, uh, having been told this looks like a new site, I could be told there's a search box and a couple of menus uh, and a number of links to articles. And leave it there, you know, leave it for me to decide what it is that I want to connect. If there's any uh, instructions, any call to action with a text, can we spot that? Bring that to the user's attention. Turn this 
case, you know, where there's a form in the page saying enter your postcode, enter your zip code. We can spot that. Uh, fairly simple natural language processing will spot and bring that to the user's attention. So that's one side of it in terms of interpreting the page. And like I said, the other side is what about reducing the user having to assess for their time? What's the top story? I'm in to insert it. Take me straight to the results and start telling me what it's found. So that's that was kind of the idea. This uh, and what we're presenting is it's still an early stage of prototype that we've been uh, developing to, to try and explore this idea. Um, that's the architecture and the approach we're taking is heavily inspired by an active area of development um, in terms of question answering. Uh, not a knowledge built from a corpus of documents. This is taking some of that idea and being able to do specific directed question answering for a document, a single web page. So there's two main components, a client and a server side. We try and offload all the heavy lifting to a server. Um, the client at the moment is implemented as a browser extension. I'll come back in a moment to explain why. Um, so as the user is browsing across web pages, the client is sending a copy of the page, uh, submitting the copy of that page for analysis. Where, uh, and I'll talk in a moment, about and analyzes that and then responds to the client to say it's ready to receive questions. And the idea is that this should be stateful. So you know, the user can ask a series of questions about one page. They can ask a follow-up question in response to an answer that they get. So to start with the client side, um, it's implemented as a Firefox extension. The client wasn't really the focus of the, the prototype development so far. Um, this is mainly been implemented like this for convenience. Um, that is that we want partly to see uh, um, what's happening. It's useful to have the browser next to it so that we can see whether or not the answers we're getting are sensible. But also it means we can piggyback off the browser doing all of the work uh, uh, for the web page. Um, like I say, the client is sending a copy of the web page to the server, and it's uh, a copy of the web page as the process, as the browser has it. So this is after the CSS has been applied, after any JavaScript has been run. This is the page as it's currently stand, the current state of the DOM. And it's not um, DOM as it is, it's using the computed values. We actually use jQuery so that um, we can work out the, the locus, the sizes, the color of the text, even if that isn't in the individual mark for a particular element. Um, the client also implemented a training mode, which I'll come back to in a moment, but it lets users, uh, during development, identify a particular part of the page and say, this is a menu, this is a search box, and send that to the server, and it lets us gather training data for some of the machine learning models we use. But like I said, the focus of the, the development so far has been on the server, and there's two main parts. Firstly, there's the receiving a, a copy of the page and analyzing that. And then secondly, it's how we process questions and queries about that page. So this is and it's implemented using uh, something called Apache UEMA. Um, UEMA is a, a framework for building text analytics applications. Um, it's the OASIS standard for doing text analytics. Um, and we're using it to create a pipeline of so we'll go through the start of the pipeline and move through a series of annotators. And each of the annotators is um, very specifically looking for a certain type of information. And if it sees it, it will add an annotation. It will add some metadata to the web page, the copy it has, to say what it's found and where it's found it in the page. Um, so the pipeline made up a very large number of these annotators. So by the time the web page comes out the other side of the pipeline, what we have is a heavy annotator from the page with all of the bits that we recognize and seen in that web page. Now, the annotators are sort of logically grouped into four main phases. Firstly, classification. Um, trying to work out what type of site we're looking at. 
Um, two strategies are used here. Firstly, machine learning classifiers. So the sorts of signals we'll be looking at, for example, a retail page will have a very large uh, number of currency symbols um, compared with other types of sites. Um, we also have uh, lists of domains that we know are certain types of sites. Um, secondly, there are annotators that will look at um, specific markup. Um, you know, in an ideal world, if, if all the web pages we were looking at had ARIA, would be great. But the benefit of having several strategies in parallel is we're not dependent on that. So for websites which don't have that kind of markup, we can benefit from other types of markup. And that could be semantic tags, identity, something like a menu. Um, or in the absence of any of that, we will look for things like um, class names in CSS. So if we want to do this, we use something like uh, the word search when they're identifying an element, a uh, part of the page for the search. The next stage is structure, where we're looking at the structure of the page. Um, most of these annotators are using machine learning approaches. And it's, if you think as a, a sighted user, when we look at a web page, if I see a series of words that or uh, there are links, they're all made, each link is quite short in terms of the number of words, they all have a similar font size, they're all arranged vertically or horizontally. At a glance, that says to me it's a menu. You know, these are the kinds of signals that uh, features that we're using with machine learning models, and the intent is to try and mimic some of that behavior that we have of, of recognizing what part of the page is based on the structure, based on the layout. And this is where the, the client is providing training data for this, so trying to get uh, people to submit uh, enough examples of this to build up a reliable model. And finally, looking at the content, um, we're using a, a, a tool called Language Web, um, which lets us build pattern matching rules, recognize certain types of instructions that are common in web pages, the kinds of things we want to draw out of them. Um, but it's still simple NLP. So what will happen at the end of that pipeline is that will be stored, it will be serialized, that, and will be ready to answer questions about that web page using all the annotations that we've uh, made to it. So the next thing the server will be doing is receiving questions about that web page. Uh, and again, this is implemented as a agreement pipeline. Um, and there are three main phases to this. Firstly, interpreting the user's question. We didn't want to make users have to learn specific commands. So we try and take in commands in natural language. And again, we're using language red to try and map the, the query we get from the user to the closest uh, match we can find in terms of the query that's called. Um, where the user uses a term that isn't in the language red dictionary, we use WordNet to uh, try and substitute in a sim. But if we can work out you know, what the user asked for, and then we will try to uh, retrieve, extract the annotation that corresponds to it. So if a user has asked the top story for a new site, we will look for the annotation that corresponds to that. If they've asked to, to do a search, we will look for the annotation that tells us what part of the page it contains the search box. And finally, uh, preparing the response for the user. So if they've asked for a bit of information, this will be um, retrieving the covered text from the annotation that corresponds to what they've asked for. Um, if they've asked for an action, like clicking on something, going to a section, submitting search, um, the server will be preparing an instruction for the client. So it'll be replying to the, the client, the Firefox client, with a, a, an instruction, a command to click somewhere. And then the, the Firefox client can simulate the necessary clicks and key presses. Um, as I said, this is still an early stage prototype. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, the work to date has been focusing on a fairly narrow set of use cases, particularly around sites that are article-based. So we're developing and testing against sites like uh, BBC News uh, and other newspaper sites, uh, sites like Wikipedia, sites like blog engines, like WordPress sites, sites where you tend to have a title and a body of text and you have category pages and title pages and link pages. And the models that we've built and trained are pretty effective at those kinds of sites. But there's still a lot of other types of websites that we need to kind of address. In particular, um, uh, real time sites, uh, Ajax -y sites, dynamic sites, because the way it currently works is the client is sending a copy of the state of the page when it's finished loading. Um, if the site changes after that dynamically without leaving a new URL, um, that isn't being set to the server. So any subsequent questions the user asks will be, won't reflect those changes to the page. 
Um, and also at the moment, the, the usability testing we have been working with uh, a charity for the blind in the UK and also with colleagues at IBM who are uh, visually impaired. Um, so we've been sort of informing as we develop, working with them to, to uh, develop our ideas, but we haven't done any formal usability testing to see how effective our ideas. Uh, and with that, uh, are there any questions? Yes, sir. Are you using Yes, Jeff. I apologize in advance. This is an unfair question. Oh, <laughs> is it on? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you could help me contrast this system with some that I'm aware of. So, things like uh, Eugene's uh, hearsay, for instance, which is kind of a dialogue management over top of the web, we'll say. Uh, or even some IBM projects. So for instance, uh, CoScriptor, uh, which may or may not work, but it's from all of them, uh, which does kind of tasks on the web. Um, I mean, I, I could venture a guess, but I was just wondering if you could help help kind of fill in some of these details of, because I'm sure there are differences, and there always are differences, but to, to really you know help me understand kind of you know what what those differences are. The the idea of the architecture is that to plug in new capability. So the idea is not to be dependent on any one strategy. This idea that we can take a large number of, of strategies and each of which is contributing a signal. So some of them, like I said, could be uh, looking for a particular markup. Um, some of them could be machine learning models from the structure of the page. But this idea that you know ideally as we come across new approaches that that we should be able to plug it in and, and it be part of the overall. Um, I, 
I think the main thing we've been trying to do is make something that isn't too dependent on, on particular sites or on particular markups, something that is flexible enough that, that is learning and, and can you know, come across a new site it's never seen before and, and still handle that based on the experience that it's built up from the other sites we've worked with. Any more questions? Okay, so I've got one. Um, so, do you do anything with regard to DOM comparison? So, obviously, lots, lots of the uh, furniture for most of the sites, even if there was, it's uh, more difficult to a less, less well built structure to have similar document object models where it's concerned with furniture. Like so, do you do any comparison to sort of identify what's What's repeated through multiple pages on some sites so you can find out what one content is what structure is. Um, sure, I understand your question, but in terms of what, so spotting patterns between pages within a domain? Yeah, so therefore you can see which, where, say so for instance, a menu, where you can see whether if, the, if there's this little list of things that we talk about, if it's repeated over pages, it's likely to be a menu. If it's oh, not see. repeated over pages, it's unlikely to be a menu. Exactly. No, it's a good point. We should. We do look for what's changed within a page as within a session. So this idea that if, if we've told you about a part of the page, when you then clicked on another link to another page within the same site, we don't want to tell you that again. So what we try and tell you what's changed, what's different in that page. But you're right, we should do the reverse of spotting what's consistent and inferring from that. Yeah, good point. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so we can thank that. Thank you. Thank you. So um, it's the coffee break next, and just to remind you, please put your stuff in your uh, vote in the box. It's very important that we get the uh, delegates to look for the challenge, and also your post-it notes for the uh, for the camp tomorrow, uh, which Markel will be telling us about. Okay, so in 13 minutes, or something. yeah. So you've got, it's three o'clock. Yeah, I'm going to do it. 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 I'm going to do it